leadership training. Let's talk some more about the Holy Spirit and, and today we want to talk about the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. We want to talk about the gifts and the fruit. Lord, please speak to us. Please challenge us. Most of all, Lord, if somebody's watching, if somebody's here, doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, have mercy. I want you to please repeat these words after me. Say, Dear Lord, please speak to me. Please touch me. Please change me. In your name. And everybody says, give somebody a smile and you may be seated. Amen. And today is Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the 120 Jesus followers that waited in the upper room. Uh, Jesus told his disciples to go into the world and preach the gospel, but to first wait for power from the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus stayed on the earth another 40 days after his resurrection and then ascended into heaven. And so 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, everybody say Pentecost. This was a Jewish holiday uh, celebrating the 50th day, the day after the Feast of Weeks. This was seven weeks. This was the first day of the harvest. And here in the New Testament, it's seven weeks after the resurrection, and then all of a sudden, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, and we talked about the wind uh, of, uh, uh, and the Holy Spirit, the role wind plays with the Holy Spirit, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting, and they saw what seemed to be what? And they saw it to be, seemed to be what? Of what? Tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them, and all were filled with who? The Holy Spirit, and began to speak another what? As the Spirit enabled them. And Jesus and John the Baptist had foretold that Christ would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so this is where we derive our name and our tradition as Pentecostals. In our tradition, uh, our distinctive form of worship is experiencing the outward manifestation of the Holy Spirit through such things as speaking in tongues. We believe today in divine healing. We believe today in miracles. Uh, we believe today a word of wisdom that the Holy Spirit comes upon someone and, and he reveals something to them for one of these three purposes. Number one, to pray for the matter or the person, or also number two, to talk to the person about something, or number three, in a service like this, to publicly say what the Spirit leads the person to say. It usually has to do with something that's coming up, something in the future, a warning, also a word of knowledge, which is basically the same thing, but it usually has to do with something in the present or something in the past. But this is our unique form of worship, which can at times be a little bit more passionate and a bit more boisterous. Can somebody say amen? amen? And so every believer, whether you're Pentecostal or not, is filled and sealed with the Holy Spirit on the very first day that you believe. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were what? Marked in him with a what? A seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a what? A deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. How many of you here this morning are God's possession? Uh, for, uh, until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So the day you accept Jesus into your heart, you also receive the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is in your heart, according to Galatians. Jesus is in your heart by faith through the person of the Holy Spirit. He's a mark upon us. He's a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come, guaranteeing who is to come, referring to Jesus returning for us. But aside from this sealing there is all of the Holy Spirit, there's also a post-salvific experience called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And the initial evidence of this is speaking in tongues. Now, tongues are a taste of heaven. 
where everyone will be able to understand each other, like pre-Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. We will also, it's a taste of heaven where there will be unity, and this is bringing everyone uh, into unity like we saw in Acts chapter 2, as well as all tribes and all tongues as we see in Revelation chapter 5, and this is being united, understanding each other, even with the different languages, worshiping together. Now, aside from tongues being a taste of heaven, as Pentecostals, we also experience something, and we practice something called divine healing, and that is we are crazy enough to believe because we've experienced it, seen it with our own eyes, it's happened within our own bodies, that we lay hands upon the sick, we pray for them in the name of Jesus, and they are healed. This is also a taste of heaven. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 referring to Jesus, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Let me tell you something. If you're going through pain this morning, here's the good news. It's temporal. Soon, one day, we'll be in a place where there will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more war. There will be no more uh, crying for the old order of things has passed away or will pass away, and sickness is part of that old order of things. We're talking about, as Pentecostals, a taste of life in heaven. So experiencing what the early believers did 2,000 years ago, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is a soul distinctive for us as Pentecostal believers. And once again this morning, we turn to our denomination, the Assemblies of God, You can look all this stuff up on ag.org under the 16 fundamental truths. But as a working definition this morning uh, to what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they're going to put it on the screen. And so you're free to read it with me out loud if you'd like to. All believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and fire according to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the normal experience of all in the early Christian church. And with it comes the endowment of power for life and service, the bestowment of the gifts and their uses in the work of the ministry, the last part. The baptism of believers is in the Holy Spirit is witnessed by the initial physical sign of what? Speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them utterance. So if you're here this morning and you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, in a couple minutes we'll call you up. If you'd like to accept Jesus into your heart, if you'd like to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, if you haven't been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, we highly, strongly, heartfelt encourage you to seek the promise, listen, of your Heavenly Father. We're not beggars. We're just asking God to do what He has already promised us to do. I first accepted Jesus into my heart, even though I was raised in church, I didn't get right with God till I was 13, because how many of you know just coming to church doesn't make you right with God? How many of you know you can sit in your garage for two hours on a Sunday morning, it doesn't make you a car? How many of you know you can sit in McDonald's, it doesn't make you a Big Mac? Some of you look like a Big Mac this morning, but it doesn't make you a Big Mac. Some of us look like Christians, but just because we come to church... Well, I came to church for 13 years, but it wasn't until I was 13 I accepted Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Came in, started doing all kinds of great things in my life, but I had always wanted to speak in tongues, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Since I was a little boy, I would see people speaking in tongues. I saw crazy things growing up in church. And so I began to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, this is the uh, August of, of 1980, I get saved. So the next few months... Uh, end of summer, fall, winter comes, January 1981, and we have our revival services. And in revival services, we'd come up, and I'd say, Lord, please fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Please, I want to speak in tongues. And people to the left of me are speaking in tongues. People to the right of me, that left, and people to the right of me are speaking in tongues. And, and I'm straight up, I'm 13 years old, I'm getting jealous. I'm getting angry. I'm getting frustrated. It's starting to play with my mind. Well, maybe there's something wrong with me. What's going on? Until I finally got to the point, one Friday night, we came, we met here about 7, 7 7.15, and I went into one of those rooms where we would pray before we would do street evangelism. 
And it was, uh, it was one of the rooms we didn't use, but we would just go in there and pray. One of the lights was out. It's kind of dark in there. I remember I'm looking down. There's this ugly orange floor, these nasty green walls, and, but there's about 10, 15 of us with our eyes closed, and we're in a circle, and we're praying, Lord, use me as I go out to the streets tonight. Save somebody, Lord. Protect us. And I straight out prayed, Lord, you know what? I'm just, I'm tired. So... You want to film me? You don't want to film me? I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to do the best I can. I'm going to preach to who I can preach to. I'm going to witness to who I can witness to. I'm going to resist sin the best that I can. I'm only 13, but God, please use me. Before I could even finish that prayer, God's Spirit came down, and for the first time in my life, I began to speak in tongues, and my life has never been the same. People in Acts experienced this. I experienced this. And there's a few things that myself, the people in Acts, and those of you, many of you, that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, from that point on, here's a few of the experiences. From that point on, this overflowing fullness of the Holy Spirit, a deepened reverence for God, an intensified consecration to God, a faithful commitment to His work, to work for the Lord, and a more active love for Christ. Christ's word and for lost souls. For those of you that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, has this been, is this still your experience as well? Also, the baptism in the Holy Spirit opens the door to the gifts of the Spirit. Paul mentions some of these gifts. There's other gifts mentioned throughout Scripture. We'll just focus on these. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 11. Now, to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the, what? Common good. And so it's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. There's an extra portion that is temporarily poured upon someone. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom or word of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge. I mentioned this. By the same Spirit. To another, what? Faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the works of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now let me give you three examples Number one, my grandfather uh, would go and preach the gospel in, in, in nations all over the world, and we have pictures, and we also have film of my grandfather uh, praying for the sick, and you have people that were blind that can now see, people that were deaf that can now hear, people that couldn't walk that can now walk, people that couldn't speak that can now speak, and, and we don't play here. There's nobody asking you back there hey, what do you need prayer for? And then somebody slips Pastor David a note, and I say, oh, my God, there's somebody here. You know, uh, you're sick of your husband, and a hundred, hundred wives waves, raise their hands. They come up, oh, my God, Pastor, how did you know? Number one. Number two, you know, I, I've been up here, and the Holy Spirit just comes upon me and says, say this, and I'm like, you say that. You know, and it's something specific, man. I mean, I, I have... The Lord has told me, just say these specific things. It's more so usually during the altar time. And the Lord said, there's somebody here this, there's somebody here that. And they're not, sometimes they're general, but sometimes they're so specific. And the reason why God does that is to let you know a couple things. That he loves you. That you can fool a lot of people, but you can't fool him. And also the Lord does it. It's more so because it's not that he wants to point you out. It's because... He wants to have a great relationship with you. And the thing, what he needs to point out to you is disturbing the relationship you have with God. And, and sure enough, every time I do it, either after the service, sometimes up to a month later, people will come up and say, Pastor, I was embarrassed, but that was me. That was me. There, there, there's someone one time that came in here, and, and just in front of everybody, the Lord gave me the message. Somebody here wants to take these specific pills to end their lives and I could have easily said someone here is thinking about committing suicide but the Lord gave me a specific message and 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 I gave that one I said that's you come forward nobody came forward so of course I walk out you know thinking way to go Dave um 
Sure enough, a month later, somebody came. They brought the pills and said, Pastor, one month ago, I was here, and I was determined. I said, Lord, speak to me. I'm going to end my life. God gave this little, humble preacher words to say. I said them, and to this day, that brother is alive, serving God. And mentions discerning spirits. I remember one time we were in the chapel over there, and discerning spirits is being able to tell someone is demon-possessed, that it, it, it's not, and we thank God for counseling. People need counseling. We thank God for medicine. Some people need medicine, but also understand that sometimes there's spiritual activity involved. And so we went, and the Lord told me, go lay hands on them. And as soon as I started going to lay hands on that person, I heard this grumbling, this deep, ugly grumbling that I've never heard before. And it was scary. And so I went over to him, and before I could even lay hands on him, he just jumped and started twisting around on the floor over there like a, like a bacon in a, hot, in, a in frying pan. He started twisting, and his mouth started foaming, and blood started coming out of his pores. And I began to call some of the deacons to help me. This is not you guys, but back then, I began to call some of the deacons to come and help me. And they were the first ones running out the door. There was just, a, as soon as he started doing that, just some of the people that were in there just started running for the door. And I went over there, and I started praying for him. Thank God that demon was cast out. But the Lord showed me at that moment, okay? That Lord showed me at that moment. Please don't be afraid to come and talk to me now after the service, and I'm going to say, hey, you wear your wife's shoes when she's not home. Hey, um, okay? I will, and even if the Lord showed me that, I wouldn't point that out in front of everybody, Okay? We serve a powerful God. And you need the power of the Holy Spirit these days to discern what's happening around you. Can I preach to you? Instead of watching so many videos that we watch, trying to learn up on this person and that person and this and that, let's spend time in prayer and say, Lord, even more importantly than what's happening in science, even more importantly than what's happening in the political world, even more importantly than what's happening with this celebrity and this sport, Lord, I'm going to get on my knees. Please show me what's happening in the spiritual world. I need to know so I can know how to pray for my family, so I can know how to pray for my neighbors, so I can know how to pray for my church. Is anybody with me this morning? And so far we learned three things from the scriptures regarding the gifts and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the first one is this. The Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts are for the common good. They're not to exalt anybody. They're not so somebody, everybody can look and say, wow, that person's spiritual because they brought a message or because they have this gift. It's for the common good and it's for the glory of God. Number two, The Holy Spirit determines which gifts go to the different believers. And number three, the number one reason that God wants to baptize you with the power of his Holy Spirit and fire is so that you can be a powerful witness for Jesus Christ. Now, is everybody going to speak in tongues? Paul tells us no. Is everybody going to preach? No. Is everybody going to prophesy? No. But there is one thing that we can all strive to do and do it together Paul says gifts are great, but one day they're going to end. And Paul ends this list of gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 saying this. After he mentions the gifts, he says, And yet I will show you the most excellent way. And here he begins 1 Corinthians 13, and he says this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can gather all mysteries and all knowledge and I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Everybody say love. Love. Now say it like Barry White, say love. love. Listen, God is concerned with what you do but he's more concerned with who you are. God wants you to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. He's concerned that you minister to others, but he's more concerned with how you treat others. He wants us to both operate in the gifts of the Spirit as well as live in the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 
explains what the fruit of the Spirit is, but the fruit of the Spirit is, say them with me, love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is a fancy word for patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Let me tell you something about gifts. Gifts, they come and go. Power of God comes over you for extra faith, for an extra discernment at that time right there. They come and go. But fruit, that's permanent. Next week, Pastor Israel will talk to more, talk to us more about the fruit of the Spirit. And he's going to talk to us specifically about the Holy Spirit and your character. Gifts are about your capability, but fruit is about your character. These two are not mutually exclusive. God's plan is for you to participate in both, for you to minister to others in the gifts and the fruit, for you to share God's power and God's love with others. Gifts and fruit. Listen. Take it from this preacher. The true you. Everybody say, my true me. The true you doesn't come out when you're ministering to other people. I'm up here preaching. And you think, wow, he's, he's a good preacher. But some people have the assumption if they're a good preacher, they're probably a good Christian. They're probably a good husband. You see somebody leading up worship up here. Wow, that, what a great worship leader she is. She's probably the best mom. She's probably the best wife in the world. Let me tell you something. You'll never know the true me while I'm preaching. The true you doesn't come out when you're ministering in the gifts. The true you comes out under pressure. As I put this on the screen. Wayne W. Dyer said this. When you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out because that's what's inside. When you are squeezed, what comes out is what is inside. See, understand this. We're, we're, we're really hoping that if you serve here, that you're connected in some kind of life group, that you're coming to prayer because sometimes there's an assumption, if I'm doing something in church, I'm right with God. If I'm working, then I'm good, as long as I'm doing something. Serving God isn't just about what you do. It's about who you are. It's about how you treat others. It's about how we react under pressure. As they show this picture right here, we talk about the fruit, the gifts and the fruit. This is God's hand squeezing you. This is your boss squeezing you. This is your spouse squeezing you. This is that person that gets on your last nerve this is that person that you've tried to make things right with, and they won't forgive you. So I want to ask you these questions. When you are under pressure, when life and its challenges are squeezing you, what comes out? When you are under pressure, how do you treat others? Let me ask you this question. When you are under pressure, how do you worship? In other words, under pressure, how do you treat God? Last question. What kind of wine are you under pressure to offer God and offer others? Let me tell you something. Under pressure, whatever you go through, there, God wants to help you shine. Under pressure, there, God wants to use you. The Holy Spirit wants to use both your capabilities and your character. God the Spirit is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So even under pressure, he wants to use you to glorify God, to exalt God, to encourage other believers, and to witness to the world, even under pressure. And so we have this promise. As a Jesus follower, in God's hands... You will be squeezed, but not crushed. You will be stretched, but never broken. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side. 
but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I'm going to open this altar for four things. I'll ask you to come forward for just a moment. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray over you. And then Pastor Israel is going to come up. He's going to lead us in Holy Communion, make a few announcements. We'll be dismissed. We're going to meet with the men. But right now, those of you watching online, those of you here, your life is not right with God. You want prayer. I'll ask you to come up. Number two, you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you would like to. I'll ask you to come up. Number three, you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it's been a while since you have felt that fullness of the Spirit, that reverence for God, that consecration, that dedication, that commitment that you first did. And today you want to come back and say, Lord, take me back to my first love. You want to come up and say, God, I want to move and operate and live in both the gifts of your Spirit and the fruit of your Spirit. I'm going to ask you to stand Come forward, find a place to pray, and let's seek God this morning. God bless you.